talking about difference between worship and stuff. Anybody know what last Friday was? Halloween. Anybody else, do you know what else last Friday was? Ah, Reformation. 497 years ago, Martin Luther took 95 theses and nailed it to the door in Wittenberg, Germany, which started the Reformation, which we're a part of today. And that Reformation, as I said, was really born in the heart of Martin Luther as he studied the book of Romans, because he came to realize that salvation was by faith alone in Christ alone. And I don't think it's too far of a stretch, as I know that uh, Martin Luther says that uh, in Romans 1.17, it was the righteousness of God that he just couldn't get by. And that passage that really grabbed his heart and began to cause him to search deeper I wouldn't be surprised at all if it wasn't the passage we're going to look at this morning that was the key passage that God used to teach Martin Luther just what that righteousness of God is and how it comes. And what excites me about that is this, and the reason I say this is because there's no passage in the scripture that's more clearer regarding the righteousness of God and how you find it and that it's in Christ alone by faith alone. And I I have this feeling that if God could use this passage in the life of Martin Luther to turn the church upside down, matter of fact, really turn the world upside down. Craig Perrell told me this week that it was uh, Time Magazine that a few years back named Martin Luther as the person of the millennium (laughs) over the last thousand years who's had the biggest impact in the world, and they believe that Martin Luther was that man. And I have a sense that this passage, if it was not the passage, it certainly contributed to Martin Luther's thinking and the transformation of the world religions and church. And so my guess is if that can change and turn the world upside down, there's a good chance this passage could turn your world upside down this morning. That's my prayer as we look at that this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 3.21. As you're turning, I'll give you the context of uh, where we've been so far. Romans 3.21, we saw in Romans 1.18 through 3.20 that God's wrath is poured out against all unrighteousness of mankind. That both the godless and immoral man, as well as the religious and moral and good person, all fall short of God's holy righteous standard. Therefore, God's righteous wrath is upon man for that. And as we finished last week, and here's man under this great condemnation from God and this wrath, we see that the law was never designed to save a person. But rather, the purpose of the law was to make a person personally aware of their sin and accountable before God for their sin. So that's where we pick up this morning in Romans chapter 3. And there's a major shift in the book that takes place here. We're moving from man's problem to God's solution. (laughs) If you've been here the last two weeks, they've been pretty heavy weeks. It isn't kind of like a bunch of good news. It was really a bunch of bad news of the reality of man's condition before God. But today we make a major shift in the book and we move from man's problem with sin and the wrath of God and the consequences it brings to God's solution to man's problem. And what we're going to see, first of all, we're going to take a look at two things this morning. The first thing we're going to see is that the declaration of the righteousness of God at the cross. The declaration of the righteousness of God at the cross. This section breaks down simply uh, as we look at it like this. First of all, he tells us in verse 21 where the righteousness of God is not found. Then in verse 22, he tells us where the righteousness of God is found. Then he takes a sidebar regarding sin, what he had talked about the last few weeks, putting this all in the context of man's sinfulness. 
And then finally, he gives us a fuller explanation of the righteousness of God in verses 24 and 25. Let me start with where this righteousness of God is not found. Look at verse 21 of chapter 3. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let me just stop there and tell you what this is saying. First of all, here, this over here can represent the law of God, the Mosaic law, all God's rules and regulations for his people on how he wanted them to live. What he's saying in this passage is that apart from the law, totally separate from the law, that this righteousness of God is not found in the law. It's set totally apart. In a different place does God manifest his righteousness. Now what he does say is that the law witnessed about this righteousness. The prophets witnessed about this righteousness. In other words, the law pointed to the person that was going to be God's righteousness. The prophets talked about and spoke about and prophesied about this person. But the prophets and the law were not the righteousness nor was it found in there. They only were the witnesses that told us and pointed us to the righteousness of God yet to come. That's how he starts this section. Then he tells us where the righteousness is found in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. This righteousness is not found in the law. The law tells us about it. It points to it. It tells us it points to Jesus, the law. It points to man's sinfulness and shows him his sin. It points to the fact that God has got a solution to his sin. The solution is not found there in keeping God's rules and regulations in the law, but it points to the fact, and the prophets told us about, and the New Testament reveals to us that Jesus Christ and faith in him is the righteousness of God. And then he goes into this little sidebar. And he says for this, for all those who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We looked at that last week. The glory of God is God in all of his perfection. It's the manifestation of God in all of his holiness and all of his righteousness. We used the illustration last week of the ceiling, which we said really it's the ceiling of the heavens that really fits. But we talked about the immoral godless man down here. We saw the good man who said, man, I'm a little bit better and a little bit closer. We got the man that is up there that's also moral and good. And he seems to be even a little bit better than the others, maybe a little bit closer. Then we had the religious moral good man way up high. The point is, compared to one another, you can say better or worse, but compared to God, they all fall short. And that's what this passage is saying. Everybody falls short of the glory of God. Nobody matches up to that. This is the illustration I like to use when I talk to people personally. We're familiar with Soldier Field. That's a, a, a shot from above from the blimp. You see that C right at the center on the 50-yard on the line? What I like to do is picture standing out in the parking lot here, and our goal is to hit the very center of the sea, right in the middle on the 50-yard line, right on the dot, right in the center, starting right here with a football. Now, what I do is I'm going to stand out here, and I'm going to tell you what, guys. When I played football, I was not a quarterback. You can tell by the body build this isn't a quarterback's body. I was a defensive lineman and an offensive lineman. But I wind up and I take that football, and you got to remember I've had shoulder surgery on top of it, so things that keep on stacking up against me. But, you know, I, I really want to really make it. So I pick up that ball, and I throw it, and I yank it, man, and that thing goes 70 yards. I'm amazed. I, I, I hit almost the end of the back of the parking lot. I'm going, man, God, that was awesome. Then Jeff Myers comes up, man, Jeff. Young stud muffin just comes rolling up here, man. <laughs> Jeff picks it and says, get out of the way, Pat. Give me that football. And he picks up that football, and he yanks that thing. And, man, this guy has been in such good shape. 
that thing went 110 yards. He went 40 yards beyond me. So much better. The problem is, Jeff was better than me. The goal was the center of the sea in Soldier Field on that line. Guys, everybody has fallen short of God's holy, righteous standard. God is so holy. He is so righteous. He is so perfect that no man can stand before God and have any claim of his own to be worthy to be in his presence. Every person in the world, best to worst, however man classifies that, stands short of God's holy, righteous standard. And so that's where we're at in the passage so far. We see that the righteousness of God is not found in the law. We find that it's manifested totally apart from keeping rules and God's commandments, but instead it's found in Jesus Christ and trusting him. He's the only answer because every man has sinned. Every man who believes has this righteousness of God. Everybody has fallen short. And then he goes into a fuller explanation of this in verses 24 and 25, and now we're going to slow down and camp a little bit more in the text. But he starts here, and he says this. Being justified as a gift by his grace. Justified introduces a new word into our discussion so far. Kind of a Bible word, kind of a theological term. Go, what in the world is that? We got to stop and understand justified before we read any further. Being justified as a gift by his grace. Now, to understand justification, I want you to turn down, look at chapter four of Romans. Let's just jump down a little bit because he goes into this a little bit further. I'm excited next week as uh, Craig will be sharing with us from Romans chapter 4. So we take a look at this, right, at this righteousness and justification a little bit closer. But as we look at this passage, listen to the first two verses of chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified, here's that word again, by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But in verse 3, he says this, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it, his faith, his belief, was credited to him as righteousness. Well, I'm going to tell you this morning what the Scripture teaches is very simple. Justification and being credited with God's righteousness because of faith are synonyms. I did not say cinnamon. I said synonyms. That means that they basically have the same meaning. You might want to say that to be credited with God's righteousness is a definition of what it means to be justified. Look down in verse 5. He shows that to us again. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Bottom line, you know what justification is? It's the very righteousness of of Jesus Christ being put to my account and your account when we put our faith in Jesus. That's what justification is. I want you to think with me for a moment like an accountant. Uh, let, let's say we got a, uh, a, an account, a record, uh, that, that kind of keeps a record of our spiritual life. On the one side is the debits. You know what a debit is? That, you know, you got zero balance right here in the center. And over here, if you spend money and you owe money, you've got a debit and you're spending on the account and you owe money. And so that's something that goes to this side, something that's taken out of the account so that you have a balance that goes below zero and you have a debt and you owe. A credit now is when you add some money into the account. 
And now a deposit is made. And so now there's a credit to my account. The more deposits we make and the more credits we have, the, the more we have in the account. So you understand me? Credit is adding to the account. Debit is subtracting from the account. The debit is my debt. My credit are really my assets and my riches. Every person is born into this world. You are born into this world if you don't know Jesus. And those of you who do, this was the case for you. Every one of us was born into this world with a spiritual debt. We were born owing God because we were born in sin. And the reality is as we continue to live our lives, the debt got bigger and bigger. And the point is, is that we get to this point in life where the reality is saying, you know, God, I've got a sin debt that is worth a billion dollars in what I owe God because of the way I've lived my life. Now, the good news is this. At the cross, Jesus paid our sin debt. He wiped it out, as it says, to tell us die, as he cried out from the cross, it is finished, basically means it is paid in full. The debt for my crimes against God were paid in full by the death of Jesus at the cross by his blood. My debt has been wiped out. My billion-dollar debt to God that I owe because of my sin is wiped out, and now I stand at the cross with it clean at zero. Now, according to the Scripture, it says this. When I put my faith in Jesus... I don't remain at zero. God makes a deposit into my account. And what he deposits it into my account is the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. So now, rather than owing God a billion dollars because of my unrighteousness, I got a billion dollars worth of unrighteousness and I owe God a debt. Jesus paid that debt at the cross. He wiped it out. I'm back to the zero balance, but I don't know. Stop there because justification means when I put my faith in Jesus, God puts a deposit in my account, and now I'm a multi-billionaire because I have the very righteousness of Jesus. Are you following me? This is unbelievable what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. That's justification. Not just your sins are forgiven, but God has credited to your account the very righteousness of Jesus. John Calvin says it like this. Justified by faith is he who, excluded from the righteousness of works, grasped the righteousness of Christ through faith and is clothed in it. And he appears in God's sight, not as a sinner, but as a righteous man. Isn't that neat? Not the one who does it by the works of the law, excluded or apart from the works of the law. What God does is he credits to my account the very righteousness of Jesus. So now when God looks at me or you as a believer in Jesus Christ, he sees us as a righteous man and woman. Praise God for clothing. We're clothed in Christ, the scripture says. When God sees me, he sees the very person of Jesus. He sees his righteousness because that's been added to my account. Now look back at verse 24. We just talked about justified, what that means. Being justified as a gift by his grace. through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Free gift. This is a free gift that God offers through faith. I want you to think with me for a second. You ever receive a gift in here? I I, I trust everybody's received a gift. How much did a gift cost you? nothing. Free. Did you ever think how much it cost the person that bought you the gift? It wasn't free to them, was it? Somebody paid for the gift. 
And justification is a free gift through the death of Jesus Christ. What's free to us was very costly to God. Justification, a free gift that cost God a bundle. It came through the death of Jesus. Justification, being declared righteous by God, being seen as righteous by God, having the righteousness of Jesus credited to us is free to you and to me, but it was extremely costly to God. You know, my wife isn't here this week. She wasn't here last week. And there's a reason for that. Actually, uh, my wife turned 60 just a couple weeks ago. Now, this may be a surprise to you. I know she doesn't look 60. But the bigger surprise is that I married a much older woman. And so that's the part that's got to be amazing. Let me ask you, you see a gray hair on my head at all? Not one. Not one. So Kim's been down in Florida. Uh, this last week I gave her a gift of being at a place where uh, she and all of her sisters never had a week to wait together, away from the husbands, the kids, the grandkids, and just a week together by the beach. And so, you know, I, I was really excited about that for her. And I'm dressed this morning not for Chicago fall, but to meet her in Florida this afternoon. That's why I look like I'm here in the middle of the summer. But... Uh, yeah, I thought about this, a side, side note, but I thought about we should all be dressed to be ready to meet Jesus, shouldn't we? Okay. We dress for the season and where we are today. Well, I'm not dressed for Chicago or for Chicago weather. I'm dressed for Florida and seeing Kimmy. And you know what? I was thinking to myself, God, I need to be ready for like that, thinking about seeing Jesus and always ready and prepared and dressed in my heart and my mind and soul to see him. That's a side note thought. But this is what happened. I really wanted to show Kim how much I love her for her birthday this year. I, I'm one of those guys, those that know I have a degree in accounting, and so when it comes to keeping my checkbook, man, it's always balanced. <laughs> I know what I got, I know what it's going to take, and I, I've been always committed to live within my means. Matter of fact, once we had kids for 20 years, Kim and I didn't exchange a Christmas gift because we couldn't afford it. We gave gifts to the kids. There wasn't enough left for us to have gifts for each other, so we just did not buy gifts for one another because we're committed to live within our means. Birthday gifts, always small gifts, you know, just something nice. Because, you know, again, we're, we, we, our first commitment is to give, and then beyond that is to live within our means and trust God to provide everything we need. Well, this year I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it different. I really want Kim to know because this cheapskate, some of us like to call it stewardship, <laughs> this great cheap steward <laughs> who's always holding back from blessing his wife with these gifts said, you know what, I'm going to do it different this year. She's never had a taste of what it's like for somebody to be extravagant in loving her. So I gave Kim six gifts this year. One of them was in my means. That was the crock pot. How exciting. <laughs> That's a typical gift for Kim and I, Christmas or birthday. But I don't want you to laugh too hard because it was one of those crock pots that stirs itself automatically. So that's, that's a high class crock pot. That's not just an everyday crock pot. So I gave her a crock pot. And that was really to kind of throw her off to think, okay. And she was excited, you know, because the way she was excited. This is awesome, man. It stirs. This is cool can't wait to use it you know so she was happy but she didn't know that there were five more gifts coming and every one of those gifts guys I blew the budget on I just said you know what I want her to love me or to love me I hope I trust she already does I want her to know how much I love her and I'm gonna blow the budget on Kim this year and one of those gifts was the week down in Florida with her sisters and making that happen, but then there were four other gifts that everyone, even as I bought them, I'm going like, should I really be doing this? I look at the checkbook and I'm going, whew. But I just, but I said, you know what, Lord, I really want Kim to know, and she was blessed, and I, I know she was blessed by it and she felt it, but I blew the budget. For her, every one of those gifts was free. But guys, I'm going to tell you what, none of those gifts was free. <laughs> 
They were all free to her, but costly to me. Can I tell you something? God so loved you that he blew the budget of heaven to lavish upon you and me his extravagant love. He gave his greatest treasure, Jesus, to die to pay for my sin debt, to take my wrath, that's what propitiation means. God says, you know what, I, 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 I ought to spank Pat, but you know what, I'm going to do it to my son instead because I love him so much. I'm going to want to show him how much I love him that I'm going to take it out on my own son. I'm going to take my greatest treasure. I'm going to blow the budget of heaven to show and lavish my extravagant love upon Pat and every person in this world to let him know how much I love him by giving my son to die as a sacrifice for them, not just so that their sin debt could be forgiven, but for those who trust him, I'm going to make a deposit into their account of the very righteousness of Jesus so that they have got all the righteousness of Christ in their account. And then on top of it, we're not even going there today, Ephesians 1, then he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God... God has blown the budget on you by giving the greatest treasure he has to let you know how much he loves you. He wanted to show it to you. He wants you to know it. He wants you to have that gift. And all of this we've seen so far over and over again. Remember verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus. This gift wasn't free to God. It was free to us. It cost the redemption of Christ. It cost his blood. It took him taking my punishment for me. But look down at verse 27 and 28. Where then is the boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith, for we maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous by God, seen as righteous, given the very righteousness of Christ to their account by faith apart from the works of the law. There's nothing we can boast about. There's nothing we can do. The law of justification is the law of faith. And I'll never forget that this idea of no boasting is so precious to me because Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourself it's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. You know why this is special to me? Because my mother in her late 60s came to trust Jesus and it was through this verse. And it was such a special time for me because I prayed for opportunities to talk to my parents. Finally said, you know, Mom and Dad, can I just share with you the most important thing in my life? I've been kind of praying God open a door, open a door, and didn't. I finally said, I said, you know, I love you guys. I spend my whole life talking to people about Jesus. Can I at least share it with my mom and dad? I've talked to them along the way, but, you know, we had the, all the different stuff. But this day, and I will never forget when I asked my mom, I said, what do you think it means so that no one may boast? And I knew she got it when she said this. Because if salvation was based on what we do, then we'd all be sitting around heaven someday boasting about what we did to get here. Guys, that's what he's saying here. Totally apart from anything we do. Totally apart from our works. Totally on what Jesus did for us solely on the basis of faith in Christ and what he's done. When a person puts their faith in Jesus, there's nothing you can brag about or boast about what you did or anything. All you can do is fall on your face and say, God, thank you for your extravagant love for me, for blowing the budget by giving your greatest treasure to die for my sin and then pour out your love and blessings upon me. That's what God has done. That's how much he loves you, and it's all on the basis of faith. So as we go to communion this morning, 
If you're a believer here, I would encourage you to do this. Just thank God for blowing the budget on you. <laughs> thank God for giving you the greatest treasure he has and said, you know, for this one, I'm pulling out everything. I'm not going to live within my means for this one. God's means are pretty big, but he took out Jesus and offered him. If you're a believer, thank him for that this morning. And then thank him he not only wiped out your debt with the blood of Jesus, but when you put your faith in him, he credited to your account the very righteousness of Jesus so that when God sees you as a believer now, he doesn't see the messes that we did all our life, but he sees us covered and clothed with the very righteousness of Jesus. And if you're here this morning, you've never put your faith in Jesus, John 3.16 says this, for God so loved, I think we understand that this morning better, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, here it is, that general God loved the whole world of people. He gave us a but that whoever, now it gets down to the individual, but whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Communion is really for the believers. It's the time to remember what Jesus did for us. If you're not a believer today, I encourage you to let that cup, that plate go by you this morning with the bread. And this is the time right now. Say, Jesus, you know what? I also have fallen short of your holy righteous standard. I deserve your wrath, but thank you that Jesus took that wrath from me. I'm going to trust him right now and trust nothing of my own but only his righteousness to make me right with you. Now we've seen already in this passage the declaration of God's righteousness offered at the cross to the one who puts faith in him. You know, there's a second declaration or demonstration in this passage of righteousness and I want you to see that as well. Look back at the text. Listen to what it says in verses 24 through 26. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We already looked at that. Whom God publicly displayed as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God wanted to make a public display of his righteousness at the cross. Do you catch me? First of all, we saw in this passage the offer of Jesus' righteousness to us who put faith in him. The second one we see is God is demonstrating his own righteousness through the cross of Christ. And he did it publicly according to the passage as we see it. We know this is an emphasis of the passage because twice he says he went back that God is demonstrating this. And so as Erwin Lutcher says, God doesn't stutter. When he says something a second time, it's because he's trying to emphasize it. It's, the righteous, it's God's own righteousness. It's demonstrated by the cross. And he did it publicly for everyone to see his righteousness. Out on a hill, for everyone to see his son die for the sins of the world. Rather than like in the Old Testament, behind a curtain inside a temple where only one man, the high priest, was able to enter once a year. Only him and God saw what was going on there. That was private. But God said, I want this to be public. I want a public demonstration for all to see of just how righteous God is by the offering of his son. So the question to me is, is that how did God demonstrate his righteousness? When it said God overlooked the sins previously committed, what he's saying here in context is that God withheld in his forbearance the wrath that man deserved for his sin in the past because he knew there was a future time that he was going to take out that wrath on his son Jesus so he could demonstrate at that time his righteousness. 
And so as God overlooked the sins in the past and his tolerance and forbearance, he was overlooking the wrath that their sin rightfully deserved because he knew in the present that he would offer Jesus for that. But how did this demonstrate God's righteousness? That's a question I wrestled with this week. I know some others have. They, they've talked to me about that. And I, I think God turned on the light bulb for me. How did God demonstrate that he was righteous by the cross? I think it's because of this. God did not write off our debt. He paid off our debt. You following me? How did God demonstrate he's righteous? Because justice demands death for man's sin. A covenant is what God made with man. In a covenant, we know that the only penalty for breaking a covenant is death and a blood covenant. And so when man broke God's laws and commands and sin, the penalty that he's worthy of is death. But God didn't just turn his head from justice and the demands of the law and just say, oh, we'll just forget about it. That, that, that's not that bad. We'll, we'll just write it off. Don't worry about it. Come on in. Just, you know what? Just trust Jesus and, and we're good. But God wanted to demonstrate how righteous he was because he met the just demands of the law not by writing it off, but by paying it off, by offering his own son, Jesus, to die for you and me and to pay for our sin debt. That's how God demonstrated he's righteous. He is perfectly holy. He can't just turn his head and pretend it didn't happen. He doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't make exceptions. God said man's sin is worthy of death, and it has to be paid. Justice demands it, and God, to prove his righteousness, he paid off the debt with his own son. So what God did is he didn't compromise either his love or his justice. And so because he loved you and me, he gave the greatest treasure he had in heaven as he blew the budget to pay the debt that you and I owed. So he didn't compromise that, but he didn't compromise his love because he gave it so you and I could have our sin debt wiped out, have the righteousness of Jesus credited to our account. God is both just and the justifier. God demonstrated at the cross that he is righteous, and at the cross he offers the very righteousness of Jesus. Now let's say you were driving and you were going 60 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour limit and uh, the police pulled you over and gave you a ticket. Did you know in Illinois that the greatest potential penalty you'd pay would be uh, $1,500 and $180? I'm sorry, 180 days in jail. So be careful when you speed. Uh, be aware. It's 26 to... Th I'm not going to tell you how to beat the system, so <laughs> we'll do that later. Can't do that from the pulpit. I'll talk to you all back later about that. <laughs> but the point is this, man. That's the size of the penalty for going 26 to 35 miles an hour over the limit. 180 days in jail, $1,500 is the potential penalty. Well, let's say that was you today on your way home from church. And you get pulled into court. And you show up. And the good news is in the draw is the judge was your dad. And your dad really loves you. You go, ah, this is good. But then you remembered, you know what, though? My dad has always been just and fair, too. Not quite sure what's going to win out here this time. You go into court, and uh, they give all the evidence against you for uh, speeding. And uh, I said, what, what do you claim? You say, you know what, Your Honor, guilty is charged. I know I, the evidence is there. There's no way out of this. And then the judge declares you guilty and uh, says, $1,500 or 180 days in jail to his own son or to you as the daughter or the son of that judge. You look and you well, I got 35 bucks. That's it. 
And the bailiff puts you in handcuffs and starts to walk you out the door to spend your 180 days in jail. And all of a sudden, Dad stands up behind the judgment stand, takes off his robes as a judge, comes down as a loving dad, and he writes a check for $1,500 and gives it to the court, and your debt is paid. Guys, that's how God demonstrated his righteousness. He doesn't fudge. He doesn't fudge on the penalty. He pays the full penalty. The reality is you've got a choice if you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Either you're going to pay that penalty someday because you did not accept the gift that your father, the judge, is offering to you today. It's not $1,500. It's the greatest treasure of heaven and saying it's my son. He has already paid for the penalty of the crime you have committed. And if by faith you will accept that gift, at that moment, not only will your debt be paid, but God will pour on the righteousness of Jesus added to your account and every spiritual blessing in your life. So as the cup comes right now, just encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, man, don't put this off another moment. Accept the gift. Because God at the cross declared and offered the righteousness of his own son to you and at the cross he demonstrated how righteous he is because he didn't fudge on the penalty but he paid it because he loved you.